three seven a.m. Can I get a roll call? Yep. We'll note that Trustee Fair is present online. With Trustees Wilson, Nickazison, and uh, Evans uh, in the room. Approval of the committee min committee min minutes, May second, twenty twenty three. So moved. Second. No comments by the chair. We have some engineering department agenda items. Good, good morning, trustees. A few items this morning. Uh, first item uh, will be the CSO volume reduction green infrastructure, the last hotel. This ordinance authorizes the district to enter into agreement with 1501 Washington Avenue LLC to provide financial assistance through the green infrastructure grant program for the construction of green infrastructure. The purpose of this project is to reduce combined sewer overflows to the Mississippi River per the long-term control plan and the consent decree. This project will reduce runoff volume with the installation of a blue roof. The total cost of the project is estimated at $162,972, and they're requesting that full amount of reimbursement for the project. In your packet, you'll find a location map, Projects located on Washington Avenue, uh, just uh, west of 9th Street uh, in North City, uh, downtown area. Any questions? <clears throat> the next item is the St. George Creek Center Relief. This action appropriates additional funds to an ongoing construction contract with Keeley Construction Group. This is an unplanned supplemental appropriation. We're requesting the work being done on the contract consists of approximately 2,400 lineal feet of sewers, eight to 21 inch in diameter. The purpose of the project is to reduce building backups and overcharge sanitary sewers. This project will provide for the elimination of one constructed sanitary sewer overflow. This supplemental appropriation of $100,000 is required to complete the construction due to some additional unforeseen costs for Class A excavation encountered uh, during construction in one of the tunnels that was constructed. And the added requirement by St. Louis County to replace streets along Weber Road uh, with the eight inch rigid base uh, pavement with an asphalt overlay. This supplemental appropriation, again of $100,000, will bring the total appropriation to $4,300,000. Are there any questions? All right, the next item is the St. Joachim Sanitary Relief Project. This action appropriates funds and authorizes staff to enter a construction contract. The work to be done under this contract consists of construction of approximately 3,700 lineal feet of sanitary sewers, 15 to 30 inch in diameter. The purpose of the project is to alleviate wet weather sanitary sewer surcharging in the area. The district received six bids on this project. The low bid was from Pace Construction Company, LLC. The bid was below our designer's estimate and our appropriation of 2,500,000, which includes contingencies and utility relocation is below the original budget for the project. Uh, Pace Construction is committed to 17.5% uh, African-American minority participation, which meets the 17% goal for the project. Next item is the Lime number three pump station and force main substation upgrade. This appropriates additional funds. Is now exiting. And authorized staff to enter into agreement with Ameren, Missouri. Uh, as the funds are needed for this substation work. The work to be done consists of construction of a new Ameren, Missouri owned customer substation. This work will be completed under an agreement with Union Electric doing business as Ameren American uh, Missouri Company. And currently with the construction of the Lima 3 pump station and force main project. This new customer substation will provide power to the Lima 3 pump station and future facilities located at the treatment plant. This letter of agreement uh, is for a long lead time equipment. Uh, we're executing uh, the agreement in April of this year and the equipment will be procured after this appropriation. The letter of agreement. 
Um, payments are due in, in two parts. There was a previous supplemental appropriation in 2018 of $2,315,000. Are there any questions? All right, the next item is the infrastructure repairs wastewater. This uh, action appropriates funds for the small infrastructure repair projects to bid through our purchasing division. This is the annual dollar appropriation uh, for our small sewer repair contract for the fiscal year 24 year. The work to be done consists of the repairs, the replacement and construction of manhole sewers and other infrastructure as identified by our operations and engineering departments at various locations throughout the district. This work is, is part of the district's ongoing CMOM program and complies with our acute defect repair requirements outlined in the consent decree. This appropriation of $7 million is to continue the implementation of the small repair program. As projects are identified, contractors will be hired through our purchasing ordinance. Staff will regu regularly notify the trustees of the status of the appropriation. Just to kind of give you some idea in fiscal year 23, uh, there were a total of 126 uh, purchase orders that were uh, done in this past fiscal year, 35% of those purchase orders were to MWBE contractors. And of the total dollars that were spent on those purchase orders, 33% of the dollars uh, went to minority and women uh, small contractors. So it's been a very successful program for minority and women uh, firms and, and helps them and a lot of these firms then graduate in, into our regular bidding program uh, which helps us in that area as well. Our service subs on our prime contracts. Any questions? All right. And the last item is the Gravoy Creek uh, to Briarstone and Gates Sanitary Relief Phase 2. This ordinance authorized staff to proceed with further condemnation efforts, including the filing of all necessary court pleadings or documents leading to the acquisition of permanent or temporary construction easements on five parcels of ground in the city of Sunset Hills and unincorporated St. Louis County. The easements and temporary construction easements are needed to construct the project, which consists of the construction of approximately 4,700 lineal feet of eight to 18 inch diameter Sanitary sewers and appurtenances. <coughs> Excuse me. Purpose of this project is to alleviate wet weather building backups and overcharge sanitary sewers, and it will allow for the elimination of one sanitary sewer overflow. Uh, this project required 25 easements. Uh, when we started, 18 have been required so far. Uh, we have one easement uh, we're working with St. Louis County, and one easement we're working with Ameren on leaving five that we're requesting condemnation. We continue to negotiate with the property owners that are requesting uh, to be able to move to condemnation uh, to keep the project moving forward. Uh, in your packet, uh, there's some maps showing the locations of the properties. Uh, the first is uh, Parcels 19 and 32, 32 is a small little wedge off to the left. Uh, as you can see, those aren't large easements. Uh, we, we do feel like we've got an agreement in principle with the property owner, but do not currently have the easement signed. Parcel 28, uh, we've been trading offers with that property owner uh, and they have not yet signed, but we're, we feel like we're getting close on that particular parcel. The uh, next map uh, in your packet, parcel 36, uh, as you can see, both of these properties are located right along Gravoy Road. Uh, we have been in discussions with them, and we feel like I think we've got the financials worked out with both parcels. We're in the process of working out agreements for both access and for uh, uh, Parking, as you can see, they're right along Gravoy Road, and they're both businesses, and we will be disrupting their parking at both those locations. 
So those can take some time uh, in negotiations, and we haven't been able to reach agreement. So we're just asking to go to condemnation to kind of speed the process up. Are there any questions? All right, that concludes the agenda items. Thank you, Rich. Uh, there is no other business on the agenda. Next tentative meeting date is July 5th, 2023. Can I get a motion for an adjournment? So moved. Second.
Okay, uh, call to order the 291st meeting of the Finance Committee. Uh, get a roll call, please. Yep, uh, we now have uh, Trustee uh, Wilson on the phone, Trustee Fair online, and Trustees no. Wilson. I'm sorry, we have Trustee Watson and Trustees on the phone, Trustee Fair online, and Trustees Wilson, Nicholson, and Evans in the room. All right, uh, motion to approve the uh, minutes of the prior meeting. So moved. Second. All right, uh, quarterly pension review. All right, uh, first. Up, we are going to have Mike Comstock from Aon go through the uh, pension report. Can you hear us, Mike? Mike, I think you were muted last I saw. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. All right. All right. Go well, ahead. good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, I will. Uh, I will run through this fairly quickly. I understand time is. Uh, uh, pressing. So I will start on page four and give you all a sense of market performance so you can better understand why the pension and um, DC plans performed the way that they did. Um, your overarching comments is the markets have been fairly decent over the last, uh, well, call it six to eight months or so. Really from the fourth quarter of 2022, we saw equity markets uh, rallied quite a bit, and that continued into the first quarter of, of 2023. And you can see some of the data on page four. Um, on the left-hand side, we're looking at the indices, um, whether they be equity toward the top or fixed income uh, indices as we go down the page, and then finally real estate. And for the first quarter of 2023, you can see global stocks were up about 7%. So continuing the, the strong performance that we experienced in the fourth quarter of 2022, uh, when equities are up seven and a half percent during that quarter, so a little bit of a, a little bit of a rally off of you know a really difficult 2022. You can see some of those 2022 numbers uh, uh, show up in that one year number. Right, the first nine months of 2022 was really difficult. You had equity markets selling off. You had interest rates rising, which pushed down the value of bonds. And we know that um, interest rates have been moving up because um, the Fed has been pretty aggressive in raising rates to try to get inflation under control. So obviously it's had a pretty significant impact on, on markets. But again, and for the last two quarters, um, you know, we're we're looking we're looking pretty good as it relates to uh, as it relates to performance. Page five is just looking at sort of everything I just said, um, 2022 into 2023 for equities on the left and for um, yields on the right. And again, from the beginning of 2022, you saw equity markets sell off. Um, and around October of 2022, you see um, the line start to drift back upward. Um, and that's surprising. There's sort of a mirror image on the right-hand side. You can see interest rates moving up. Now, when interest rates sort of topped out um, in October, you can see that rates move back down. You know, that was certainly part of why we've seen an equity market rally since then. Um, and it's all about what the Fed is going to do, uh, what inflation is going to do, and how those two combinations are going to impact economic growth going forward. Mm. On page six, we sort of detail some of that. And also bring in the, the question, um, the issues that we saw out of the regional banks that, that started in, in March. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you can see what our views were at the beginning of this year and what we were thinking at the end of March after we saw you know, these banks come under under stress and um, fear that you know some of these regional banks may not be sustainable going forward. But on the left hand side, can a global recession be avoided? You know, what we would have said at the beginning of the year was that there's likely going to be some sort of growth problem in 2023. And as we sit here today, uh, we feel that there's more likely to be a growth problem in 2023. And a lot of that has to do with the banks and um, you know, credit creation. If you think about if you think about credit creation being impacted going forward and the uh, stress and uncertainty that banks are under, well, the more capital that banks keep, the less they lend. So there's a direct impact on, on how banks position themselves and how the economy grows through through credit creation. So on the on the bottom, you know, as it relates to the Fed, you know, the Fed's raised short term interest rates to five, five and a quarter, uh, and they've done that aggressively again over the last year and a half or so. They're not going to stop until inflation is under control. And the latest CPI print uh, was at uh, just shy of 5%. So, you know, our, our core view X, the bank issue, was that the Fed's unlikely to stop. Um, but as 
you know, credit creation could be impacted um, through through this banking crisis. We think that there's a greater chance that the Fed will pause, and maybe as early as June, um, you know, some of what's happened from the banks could take care of of economic growth you know, for the Fed. And if uh, the economy isn't growing as strong, you bet that inflation is going to come down with it, which is really job one of what the Fed has been marching towards for the last year and a half. So those are sort of big picture views. Um, there's a lot of slides after this that I'm not going to spend the time walking through, but if there's any questions on anything, it just sort of looks at the health of the economy, dives in deeper to the banking crisis, um, and then looks at how the market is pricing things in. But again, um, just kind of given, um, given the shortage of time, I'm going to move ahead to slide 15, but I'll just pause for a quick second to see if there's any questions. There are no questions right now, Mike. Thanks. All right, that sounds good, Tim. So you shouldn't be surprised to see the pension plan perform well. Um, there's a good, a good portion of the pension plan is within equities. And again, as equities are rallying 7.5% uh, for the quarter. Um, you can see here what that's done to your first quarter return for the pension plan, up 4.6%. Um, outpacing the policy benchmark by 0.6% uh, um, net of fees. Now, the one-year number is negative, and a lot of that is – uh, the difficulties that we experienced in 2022. So for the past year, we're looking here, I guess, from April 1st uh, through 331. Well, from April through September of last year, the markets were in, 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 um, in sell-off mode as it relates to equities, and that's why you see the negative number trend. Um, it, that's why you see the negative number here for the uh, 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 for the one-year period because it, it's just showing the difficulty that we experienced in 2022. I'm going to go to page 17, and again, this is an important slide, just giving me a sense of if the monies are invested where they're intended to be, and you can see here that the gray bars are the policy targets across various asset classes, and the red is where um, the actual asset allocation is, and we're fairly tight across the board. Now, real estate's one of the outliers. Um, this real estate allocation is down to 7.5%. We would expect that to continue to draw down. We're in an exit queue for the real estate manager. Um, it's just a uh, um, sort of an illiquid investment at this point, and monies are filtering in slowly. So you can expect to see the real estate allocation continue to continue to draw down a bit. Page 18 looks at the pension plan performance, top line, and then we get into the individual asset classes and underlying managers. And again, as said, this is a good quarter for, um, for markets generally. So for your liquid equity and bond managers for the quarter, you're going to see some pretty strong absolute performance. Um, and again, that leads to the 4.6% pension plan return. And then underneath on, um, on page 18, you can see um, your, your U.S. equity portfolio across large cap, small cap, and then the international equity portfolio. And again, all posting very strong absolute performance. Um, you know, roughly seven, seven and a half percent or so on average for your equity portfolio. Page 19 looks at um, the remainder of the equity portfolio, the emerging market fund, and then uh, the fixed income assets. And then you have your real estate portfolio, which stands at, again, that's seven and a half percent. Real estate's come under stress of late, um, generally speaking. Uh, you know, economic conditions tightening, interest rates moving up. Um, thoughts about refinancing have all sort of been baked in that commercial real estate um, outlook, and it's impacting performance, and you can see that there. But one thing that is different, finally, you know, is um, fixed income. Uh, fixed income returned 3% in the first quarter. And again, rates have sort of steadied uh, of late, certainly through this quarter, but you have a higher yield, finally, right? Fixed income investments are finally delivering something, Um you know, with the 10-year the treasury at 3.7, you can get 5% going out just a few months on the treasury curve. So there's yield out there, and that's favorably impacting fixed income, and that's why you see a 3% return there. All right, I'm going to switch gears to the DC plan here. Again, I know I'm going quickly. If there's anything, just please, uh, please stop me. But page 21 is looking at an aggregate, your DC plans. Um, over $113 million now in these plans. The majority of, of that money, 40% uh, or so, uh, is in the target date funds by Vanguard. And we think that's great. We think this is where the majority of investors should be. These target date funds have a risk profile that lines up generally with the average person's age or when they're trying to retire. So the 2060 fund, as an example, is for someone that's probably going to retire in the next 35, 40 years. It has more equity exposure than, say, the 2025 fund, 
which is designed for someone that's um, approaching retirement and has significantly more fixed income, um, a safer risk profile. And the performance lines up as we would expect. These are index funds, so we're not trying to beat the benchmark. Um, but in this particular quarter, the more equity exposure that the funds had, the better they did. Equities outperform bonds, and that's why you see the longer dated funds performing better than the shorter dated funds in absolute terms. Page 22 is looking at uh, what we call Tier 2 and Tier 3. Tier 2 are the passive funds managed by Vanguard, and Tier 3 are the active funds. And you know, pretty, pretty decent results, some, some very large numbers out of a couple of these managers, um, the growth-oriented strategies. Um, Vanguard U.S. growth was up 15.8% in the quarter, and then Vanguard International growth was up 12.5. Um, after difficulties for technology in 2022, with rates going up, that particular sector has done uh, relatively better than the rest of the market of late. Um, and that's why you see these growth funds, which tend to have more technology exposure, uh, doing better than the rest of the funds in the portfolio. And then the all important fees on 23 and 24, these are the last two slides I'll cover, but this is important just to make sure that we understand what is being paid for investment management fees, but then also how is that relative to what we see out in the marketplace? And when we put together this universe uh, peer comparison for you to give you a sense of, of how that stacks up. And on the left hand side of page 23, you can see all the funds in the pension plan and then sort of in the middle the fund expense ratio uh, and then how that stacks up to the universe median. And th things look pretty good here. Um, you know, we would we would look at this and say that the fees are reasonable uh, for what you're getting out of these out of these active uh, and passive strategies. And then page 24. Um, again, you, you probably read all about the, the lawsuits within DC plans for um, fees being too high um, and participants, you know, hooking up with with law firms to to sue plan sponsors and. You know, a slide like this and a program like what you have gives us comfort. Vanguard, as you know, is a low cost provider, but here you can see just how low the costs are across the board. Your target date funds are eight basis points. That's favorable relative to the universe of target date funds, which is, you know, roughly 13 basis points or so on average. So you're cheaper. Um, and then the Vanguard funds, again, their model is to keep costs low. The most expensive active fund is, I'll say only 32 basis points. That's really low. Um, and you can see how that stacks up relative to you know, the universe median for that particular category. I'm looking at the Bangor International Growth, 32 basis points relative to 82 basis points on average for an institutional quality uh, international fund. So I'll just conclude by saying your fees are extremely reasonable and low, um, and things things look good across the board. Market market's been um, rewarding your participants and your pension plan with absolute uh, performance of late, and let's hope it continues. I'll pause there, Tim. Uh, if, if there's any questions, uh, hopefully I hit the uh, uh, the time you're yeah. looking for. I know, but I think you're good, thanks. Like, any questions for Mike? All right, Mike, thanks so much um, for your time, and no questions this time. If anything comes up, though, I will reach out. Yeah, I'll talk to you soon, Tim. Thanks. All right, thanks. I'll also know we did make a, a pension contribution in the last month, so we usually do that semi-annually, so we put about six and a half million dollars into the pension um, a few weeks ago. All right, we have one more thing on the agenda, and that's the monthly operating uh, portfolio report, which is the, the uh, grid. We do have some changes this month. The most important one is that we're back in compliance. Is now exiting. Oh, thank you. Most important one is that we are back in compliance with our commercial paper allocation. Uh, I was going to start in the upper left. The portfolio is about $60 million lower than what it was last month. That's because we had uh, roughly $60 million, a little bit more of debt service, principal and interest payments at the beginning of the month. We also made that um, pension contribution. So altogether, we're down about $60 million. Yield to maturity is up 24 basis points, so a decent uh, gain. In our yield to maturity, um, some of the maturities that expired, some of the debt that came due to pay the debt service was uh, had a lower rate on it. And then the new um, stuff that we put to work um, was around 5%, so higher than the benchmark, which stayed the same at 426. Weighted average maturity went up slightly. Uh, sector allocation is roughly the same, one or two points down in each of those categories, but every, everything's within our policy limit. Then on the fund summary, we can see those balances for everything except the operations continue to drive lower, although actually operations was down 50 million as well. Um, 
the yield of maturity is up because of uh, turnover in the investment portfolio and the higher rates we're seeing in the market. And then on the maturity distribution, you just see a comparison there versus the benchmark. Um, we're roughly in line with where we usually are, just some small changes a month over month, just a few, uh, a few basis points. Again, we have a whole bunch in that zero to one year, roughly half our portfolio, because we do use it for operations and paying projects. Um, whereas the uh, benchmark is mostly, there's all really in that one to three year, almost all. Um, any questions about the portfolio report? If not, I don't have anything further in the finance committee, Mr. Chair Evan. All right, thank you. Uh, next tentative meeting date is July 5th. Uh, motion to adjourn? So moved. Okay. Okay, good morning. Uh, <coughs> the Stakeholder Relations Committee me meeting of uh, this is the June meeting. Um, mm -hmm. Can I get a roll call, please? Yep. Uh, just since it's complicated, I'm going to go through this again. We have uh, Trustee Fair online, Trustee Watson on the phone, and in person, we have Trustees Wilson, Nick Azison, and Evans. Thank you. Um, there are no comments by the chair. Entertain a motion for approval of the committee meeting minutes. Of uh, May second, so moved. Second. Thank you. Is the uh, discussion item, Mr. Meyer? You have the next two items. I do. Thank you. Good morning. 
Uh, the first item is proposed resolution 3845. This resolution will authorize the renewal of the contract with Cardinal Point Partners for federal legislative services. This will be for the fourth uh, option year of four years. So the contract, um, this will be the last year for the contract. What we will do is go out with a new RFP later this fall and um, and go through that process at that time. But for right now, this resolution will just uh, authorize the fourth option year. Any questions? Okay, I'm gonna move on to item number five then. And this is regarding uh, four resolutions for our general legal services contracts. The first one is proposed resolution 3841. This resolution authorizes the renewal of the contract with Armstrong Teasdale for legal services for the fourth of four option years. Again, all four of our general legal services contracts will expire after this year. So we will go out with a new RFP later this fall uh, for new selection. But resolution 3841 is for Armstrong Teasdale. Proposed resolution 3842 authorizes the renewal of the contract with Rynearson, Sue Schnurbush, and Champion for legal services for the fourth of four option years. Any questions? Proposed resolution 3843 authorizes the renewal of the contract with Thompson Coburn for legal services for the fourth of four option years. And the final uh, proposed resolution is 3844. It authorizes the renewal of the contract with White, Coleman, and Associates for legal services for the third of three option years. Uh, White Coleman was added uh, to our suite of legal service contracts when uh, Larry Hale passed away. He was, um, and she, the, uh, White Coleman fulfilled the portion of the contract that Larry used to hold. So White Coleman is 100% MWBE. Any questions? Okay, okay thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a requirement to go into closed session to discuss legal confidential privilege matters under paragraph 610. 021 subparagraph one. Uh, can I get a motion to move into closed session? So moved. Second. Is there person? Okay. And then we also, um, I'm sorry, just if I may add to the motion, there's also, um, it was added uh, to a motion to go into personnel actions under section six, oh, um, personnel actions under section 61021 um, May I amend the motion for, for that? So moved. Second. All right. So we have a motion and a second. So Trustee Evans. Yes. Trustee Nicholson. Yes. Trustee Wilson. Yes. Trustee Fair. Yes. Uh, Trustee Watson, um, I think, is muted. Um, we do have the votes to go. As, ask him to text. Okay. Uh, Trustee Watson, if you can text a yes or no to Wendy. Uh, it will not. All right, he says yes, so um, we are now in closed session. For Trustees Fair and Trustee Watson, I believe Wendy sent out a link to a new closed session meeting. So We're going to move next door, folks. Um, please uh, check into that link, and, and we'll have that set up shortly. Thank you.
At 9.26 a.m., Trustee Nick Azizson made a motion, uh, seconded by Trustee Evans, to come out of closed session. The board voted unanimously uh, to come out to approve the motion. And then at 9.27, Trustee Wilson adjourned the open meeting and ended the committee meetings.